Well, if you were here last week or you've seen the sermon on YouTube, um, I had to leave out part of my pointage, <laughs> the heading last week. We talked a bit about what the incarnation actually is, and that, of course, is God the Son taking on himself a human nature, not ceasing to be God in any way, not merely combining some kind of 50-50 hybrid being, but fully God and fully man. And that Jesus came, one of the reasons he came was to reveal God to man. Uh, we recognize that, as Psalm 19 tells us, Day after day, night after night, the knowledge of God goes forth into all the world and there's no language and no place where man does not know that there is a divine creator and that he is ignorant of the aspects of who this creator is. The problem, however, is that we are fallen and sinful. The doctrine of total depravity means that we're not as bad as we possibly could be, but that every facet of our being is tainted and diseased by sin, including the ability to think clearly, as we can see around us. So today we're going to look at three other aspects of the Incarnation. One, he came to redeem. Two, he came to restore and to reign. But first, we're going to finish last week. He came to reveal man to himself. Through his incarnation, Jesus Christ reveals man to himself clearly. He shows us what we truly are and then models what we may be. By the way, this is where many liberal theologians will stop. This is, this is it for them. Jesus came as an example of what it means to be good, and the cross is an example of how bad people can really be. It's only good insofar as it goes, but it is true that Jesus came to show us who we really are and what the goal would be, that is, maturity in Christ. Now, the Bible clearly teaches that man had his origin in what we would call the immediate creative power of God. That is, there was nothing existing that God had to... Wait a minute. He did. He used dirt. As I've said, we're all glorified dirt. But where did the dirt come from? Oh, that's right. In the beginning, God created. So man was created not by a process of evolution through different uh, genetic changes, but from the dirt of the earth, and God breathed life into him, and he became the first man. Also says in Genesis that man is the grand consummation of all creation, created in the image and likeness of God. So man differs from every other animal, every other creature. And man, even in his lowest estate, seeks to worship. Uh, many theologians have said it's not homo sapiens, but homo adorans, man the worshiper. There's always something that man is worshiping. The object of worship could be a false god, it could be the true god. Animals do not do this, among other things. And of course, the narrative tells us, historically, Adam fell. He exchanged his loyalty, his fealty, from God to Satan and to himself. He disobeyed God, and immediately the life cord was severed. Adam died both physically and spiritually. Physical death began to do its work at that very moment where Adam fell. And the grave for Adam was not a matter of if, but when. And yes, he died that day. He died spiritually. There was no longer spiritual life for Adam to take part of. Now all men, from Adam on down, are born spiritually dead in sin. We have a, what we call a sin nature or the flesh. We are capable of every trespass against God. There was one interview with, with uh, Charles Colson that Dan Rather was gobsmacked because he, he was interviewing Chuck and they were recounting the story of a, a guy who had been through Treblinka, the Nazi concentration camp. And this man was present at the Nuremberg trials. And when the camp commandant came and took his place at the witness stand, this, this man collapsed 
He was out, he, he, he just, you know, lost it and fell down and was unconscious. Later on, telling Mike, Wall did I say Dan Rather? I think I meant Mike Wallace. That was it. I actually got to meet Mike Wallace. Not a nice man. Anyway, so, and Mike Wallace said, well, was, what, what caused you such consternation? And the, and the guy said, well, it's because he just seems so normal. He seemed like any other person in this room today. And he was remembering all of the stuff that took place at Treblinka. Mind-blowing. The Bible says that we were born dead in our trespasses and incapable of doing anything Godward positively. In other words, if all of us were left to our own devices, we would choose the bad. Even the good we choose would be tainted by impure motives and selfish reasons. The sin nature of Adam and the guilt of his sin it's what we call imputed to the whole human race. In Adam's fall, we sinned all, the old New England primer. So part of his posterity, that's you and I, corrupted with sin. The highest self in man is altogether unprofitable to God. All men are not equally corrupt in word and deed, but all are equally spiritually dead. And unless the function of death is brought to a halt, it will destroy not only the body, but also the soul in hell. And because of the solidarity, the unity of the human race, sin and death have passed to all men. Romans 5.12, by man came death, and in Adam all die. Now, while this is clearly stated in the Bible, man obviously still thinks of himself as being not that bad or pretty darn good, depending on who you're talking to. So we have to have a revelation of God to tell us who we really are, or we will walk on in this deceived manner, thinking, oh, I'm not, at least I'm not as bad as that person. It's always the, the grading scale. And I'm not as bad as, what's the word we always put in? Hitler. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Now, in my house growing up, it was Stalin, but okay. <laughs> it's because dad knew his history. So in order that man should see himself, not in the light of his own goodness and being, but beside the perfect standard of God's holiness, because that is, that is the standard. If you want to keep the law, you got to keep the whole law. If you break one part of the law, you've broken the whole law, and you deserve death, and you will die. So God the Son became incarnate. Our Lord said, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. That's back in John chapter 15. See, responsibility increases with knowledge. And so the Lord's coming showed us how far short of God's standard of righteousness that we truly fall. The Lord Jesus said, if I had not done among them the works which none other man did, then they had not sinned. That's again from John 15. Jesus didn't man, mean that man would have been sinless had he not come, but that the incarnation revealed the heart of man. There's real, honest to goodness, true hatred for righteousness in man. Son of God incarnate was sinless in every aspect, and yet man, Jew and Gentile alike, crucified him. So when compared with Christ's perfection in his life and in his works, the sin and guilt of man is exposed in all its depravity. It's for all to see. When man sinned against the Son of God, he sinned against the clearest possible light. What do we read from John chapter 1? The light came into the world and the darkness has not overcome it. But people still hate the light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. He came into his own and his own received him not. And then Gentiles joined hands with his own and put him to death. It's Acts 4. How sinful is the heart of man? Look at Calvary and be amazed. So Jesus came to reveal us in our true self to ourselves. Now let's go to our second point this morning, and this is probably central to everything. In fact, I'd say it is. He came to redeem. 
The Apostle Paul states clearly the purpose of the incarnation in the following words from Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So that he might redeem those. That word redeem has a Latin origin. It means to, to buy back. But as Warfield pointed out, it doesn't quite reproduce the Greek words in the New Testament, although it's the same fundamental idea of a purchase. You've heard me say many times that for, for the price of buying us off of the auction block of slavery, we were just like standing there in chains with no hope of freedom, and to buy us freedom, Jesus gave his life. It means really to buy out or to ransom which suggests kind of a, a, a repurpose. If you think about in the garden, Adam, true righteousness, fell under the mastery of sin and death. Now Jesus comes, the second Adam, he, he succeeds where the first Adam failed. Now, now we have the, the possibility, the, the option now that God would buy back a people because the price has been paid, not to Satan, but to the law of God and to righteousness. And of course, God's decrees, this redemption has a purpose. He doesn't just buy out a people for nothing. What does Paul write to Titus? Writing about, quote, our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem or ransom us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. I love the fact in, in C.S. Lewis's space trilogy, the hero's name is Ransom. And in the narrative, that's exactly what he does. I'm reading the, the last book right now, so I'm kind of into it, sorry. And Jesus Christ is man's redeemer. And the Old Testament contains the, the accurate record of 4,000 years of sin and human history and failure and consequent divine judgment. And the one bright hope was the coming of the promised seed, the deliverer, the redeemer. That's Genesis 3.15. We talked about how Jesus has crushed the head of the enemy. That's, that's from the, the promise. And God speaking to the serpent saying, Here's what's going to happen to you when the deliverer comes. And with each succeeding revelation from God, the promise grows clearer, the hope grows brighter. That's why at the fullness of time, Elizabeth and Zechariah were ready. They were ready for the Messiah. And when Zechariah finally says, okay, we're going to name him John, because <laughs> that's what the angel said, then he could speak. My sister did a nice, nice little reading yesterday at our family Christmas about that. And the prophets all spoke of the Messiah who would come to deliver his people. Perhaps one of the clearest ones would be from Isaiah 53. I'll go home and read that this afternoon. Since the people needed a deliverer from the guilt and penalty of sin, the intent of the incarnation was to provide that Deliverer who would ransom and redeem a people for himself. Jesus Christ, we call him Savior and Lord. We call him Lord because of his kingly prerogatives. We call him Savior because what the promise would be that he would save his people from their sins. In fact, that's from Matthew 121. She will bear a son, says the angel, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And at his birth, the angel testified again, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And the Lord Jesus himself voiced emphatically the purpose of the incarnation, Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. There could be no hope of deliverance from sin or death apart from the incarnation of Christ. 
the character of God, which is righteousness. What does the psalmist say? Righteousness and justice are the foundation of, the, of your throne. Those two words very commonly interchange. They're not the exact same thing, but they're often used in the same sense. Justice and righteousness. And his righteousness is absolute. If it was not, then it wouldn't be righteousness, would it? It's uncompromising. It demands that every sin be dealt with. And while we rejoice and and love the fact that God is merciful and gracious and slow to anger, forgiving iniquities and transgressions, yet, Exodus 34, 7, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. While God is love, God is holy and he is righteous. He is so holy that the prophet Habakkuk in 1.13 says his eyes are too pure to approve evil. And you, speaking to the Lord, you cannot look on wickedness with favor. In other words, God just doesn't let sin go. We're We're going to be nice to you this time. Remember the first principle, justice, which is no partiality? Well, God's righteousness demands that Every sin be dealt with impartially. It's pure justice. And in order to be, to be true to himself, himself who is perfect integrity, God had to deal with the problem of sin. So to deal justly with the problem of sin and at the same time mercifully, someone had to suffer the death penalty for the sin of the world. So God sent his son to die as the perfect substitute for his people and thereby redeemed or ransomed those same people. Man was lost to God into heaven and God's purpose and redemption could be realized only through the incarnate son of God. For the son of God incarnate is the connecting link that brings together God and sinful man. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. The sinner's relation to Jesus Christ is absolutely vital. Christ became a man that by the grace of God he should taste death for every man, Hebrews 2.9. The Word, who is the eternal Son of God, became flesh and was made in the likeness of man, bearing man's perfect stamp in order to redeem him. Mark 2, 17, where Jesus says, I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So if there had been any other way for God to take care of the problem of sin, of course he would have done so. Had there been any righteousness in the human heart, even the smallest drop, I recall when R.C. Sproul is teaching on the topic of total depravity and he draws a circle on the board and he starts shading it in. How how much of this is going to be black by the time I'm done? Of course, it's all there. I used to use the analogy of little girls helping their mommies making like a strawberry shortcake birthday and so it's going to be pink icing and the icing starts off. It's just powdered sugar and Crisco. I don't know what you guys use, but... It's white. It's great. But you don't want a white cake. You want a pink cake. So what do you use? It's that USDA approved red food coloring number five, right? And you put some of that in the icing. And it's the icing is still not pink. What has to happen? Well, you got to stir it. And by the time you're done, how much white icing is left? None. It's all pink. Well, that's the way it is with the human heart. If there had been any white icing in our heart, then maybe maybe Jesus didn't have to come, didn't have to be incarnate. But no. And only in the self-righteous heart of the religious moral man satisfied with himself do we find this careless indifference to the gospel of redemption. And you can be religious without being in church. Everyone's religious on some level. 
I'm going to believe the science. Oh, well, by, by gum, go ahead. When man assumes a righteousness that's his own, he's, he's, he's not even in the ballpark anymore because he thinks he's healthy. He's outside the reach of the great physician apart from God's grace. The man who excludes his own need of Christ misses the purpose of the Savior's coming and will not be saved. Each of us must say with Paul, 1 Timothy 1.15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all, or chief, chief of sinners. So that's our, our second point. Jesus came to ransom, to redeem. Third, he came to restore. The incarnation of the eternal son is, is part of God's decree, his divine plan. And that plan comprehends a goal, and God assures the accomplishment of it. So even though the salvation of man was God's chief concern, his plan was not limited to the world of mankind. It is written of the Son who was with God and who was God that all things were made by him. And Paul writes, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Of course, that's from Colossians chapter 1. Man was higher than all the other created beings in earth, and all other creatures were subject to and are subject to man. However, the fall changed everything in that relationship. Even between the man and his song-inducing new wife. Oh, finally, bone of my bones, I finally have some. And the fall took place, and it's been a battle of the sexes ever since with many sitcoms. So the question is, will God restore again to man the kind of dominion that he had before the fall? I remember when I was first converted, walking with Christ seriously, and, and my, old, my pastor, Steve Chupp, and I, we were walking one Sunday afternoon, and I said, you know, I'm kind of interested in those cosmic implications of the gospel. Now, he didn't know what I meant. He thought I was talking about some kind of weird New Age stuff. I was like, no, I mean like, uh, like trees clapping and lions not killing people and things like that. And quasars. Oh, okay, you mean like all creation. Yeah, that kind of stuff. That's kind of cool. I thought it was interesting. The prophet said that the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the young goat and the calf and the young lion and the, the fatling together and a little boy will lead them and a cow and the bear will graze together. I mean, if you're a bear, you see all that steak. What are you going to do? Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. A nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand in the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. Indeed, it appears that the prophet here is looking towards a time in the future of the restoration of the earth and all of its creatures. In fact, the cruelty of beasts was not a thing before sin entered the world. This bloodlust among God's creatures sprang from the sinfulness of man and is a part of the curse. And to remove this curse and rescue all of creation is another one of the purposes of the incarnation. See, when Christ's reign is in its fullness and the government will be upon his shoulders, Isaiah 9, 6, then the sons of God, that is those who are adopted into his family, will be manifested and will share with him in a restored creation. If it were not so, then all of nature would remain spoiled and ruined and marred by Satan and sin. But God has said in Hosea 2.18, In that day, I will also make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, birds of the sky and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow and the sword and war from the land, and I will make them lie down in safety. You see, the problem with the, problem with the social justice movement is they want to do this before God's ready to, 
And then, of course, not all animals are equal and everything goes to hell in a handbasket. But God said he is going to do this in the fullness of Christ's reign. When he comes back to judge the quick and the dead, then we're going to see this stuff take place. I'm looking forward to it. Long time, could be a long, long time, I don't know. Indeed, Colossians 1.20 says, God will, quote, gather together all things in Christ, both which are heaven in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. Well, that's Ephesians 1.10. And that day our blessed Lord will completely, quote, reconcile all things to himself. Colossians 1.20. See, many parts of the church are, are given to kind of an over-spiritualized, in fact, even considering physicality to be a bad thing. I, I, I quoted the, the Eastern idea of the body as a shell to be thrown off at death so that your soul can be free. And somebody last night said, well, yeah, exactly. That's, that's why I want to be cremated. I was like, no, that's the error. That's not true. We're going to be resurrected physically. And this broader application that we look at, it, it doesn't mean that we in any way discount the central significance of Christ's redeeming word, work shedding his blood so that our sins would be forgiven. The blowtorch of God's wrath poured out, pointed out and poured out on his son instead of on you and me. <clears throat> but I believe that the entire creation, the cosmos is in view. In Romans 8, 19 through 20, Paul famously writes, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. Think of that, futility. When people have a futility of their thinking, they can't think straight. And even now, as glorious and beautiful, well, this time of year, maybe not so much, but as glorious and beautiful as creation is, it still has to go through death, birth, all that cycles of pain that we see. There's still carnivores. He says the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the fruit, first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. See how a critical physicality isn't bad, it's good, it's right, it's just corrupted, it's fallen. And here in Romans chapter 8, we're told that the deliverance of the entire created order will be revealed in the revealing or manifestation of the sons of God. Now, folks, this, this begins at conversion. When you cross from spiritual death to spiritual life. And as the good Dr. Gill says, quote, the full manifestation of the sons of God will be in their glorification at Christ's second coming when they shall be openly taken into God's family. Now we're adopted in a similar way that we're justified. We're, we're justified so that God declares us righteous, but are you now perfectly righteous in your practical life? No, but God sees you as perfectly righteous through Christ. We're also adopted into his family. But John Gill says it's when that is openly manifested, pulled into God's family so that everyone can see, will be their glorification and will have that honor and dignity which belong to their character actually conferred on them so that they shall appear not only to themselves but to all the world to be what they are now. Now this in the whole compass of it might be said to be the earnest expectation or waiting for. When God in all of his decrees and providence is Everything's out in the open, manifest. Right now, as, as good Dr. Spurgeon said, if we only had a yellow stripe to tell us who the elect were, then we'd be safe, right? 
Well, we don't. We don't know that because it's not been fully manifest yet. But there's a day coming when, yes, all of God's glory will be on display. And part of that glory is in those people, those losers that he deigned to save in the first place, like you and me. All creation is expectant of a rescue from this present corruption and of deliverance that that place God gave it in the beginning when man fell. Nature is now under the curse of sin. It's groaning and travailing in pain. It's not what it was in the garden, nor is it now what will be when the incarnate Son returns, Hebrews 2, to put all things in subjection under his feet. Before Adam sinned, there were no carnivores, there were no deserts, there were no thorns or thistles. So when you went to work, there was no resistance. And after the fall, lots of resistance and sweat and toil and labor. Now that the Son of God has come and purchased redemption by his death, the whole creation will eventually be rescued from the curse and restored to its original sense. So that's my third point. He came to restore. Finally, point number four, he came to reign. We know that the account of the wise men, we sang, we three kings. They came from the east to Jerusalem. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? They knew. They knew that there was a king who hadn't been on the scene before. We're not going to worship Herod. We got to worship the king. We have seen his star in the east and we've come to worship him. When the Old Testament prophets wrote of the Messiah's, the Messiah's offices, they always included that of a king. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt. The foal of a donkey. That's from Zechariah 9.9 and fulfilled in Christ's uh, uh, glorious entry on Palm Sunday. David wrote of Christ and his kingdom when he said, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, Psalm 2. Our Lord is not only prophet and priest, but potentate. What's the hymn? The potentate of time crown him with many crowns. The king. So in considering these purposes of the incarnation, we're, we're compelled by Scripture that the eternal Son became man in order to reign, to be the king of all. Paul wrote, quote, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. That's, that's absolute. Philippians 2.9. So we dare not limit the exaltation of Christ as some try to do it, we, we say, yes, Christ's exaltation, his resurrection, ascension, sitting in the right hand of God. If we look back again at Philippians 2, though, you'll see that Christ, we could say his downward steps in humiliation were just temporary. They were leading to a permanent exaltation, culminating with every knee bowing and every tongue confessing in heaven and on earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The, the Trinity, again, is inextricably bound up in all of this. The incarnate Son is to appear in his resurrected body and to sit on the throne of his glory. Jesus himself said, that when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. John writes in Revelation 1.7, every eye shall see him. The prophetic utterance spoken by God to David in 2 Samuel 7 concerning David's seed is going to have an everlasting throne in the kingdom. It's got a double fulfillment as we learn when we study prophecy, primarily it refers to Solomon's temple, but ultimately and finally it speaks of Christ's reign as Zechariah 6.12 shows. The day must come when all things will be 
subject to Jesus. The psalmist spoke of his throne as enduring. Psalm 89.4, I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. Psalm 89.29, I will establish his descendants forever and his throne as the days of heaven. And then one more, his descendants shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. God promises that Jesus' reign and kingdom will endure forever and ever, and that the one to occupy it will be David's seed, his rightful son. Think, we were just talking yesterday about the two different genealogies, one in Matthew and one in Luke. Matthew was at great pains to demonstrate that this Jesus whom he wrote about was the descendant of his father, David. And it was always called the son of David. See, Matthew 9, 27, and Mark 10, 47, Luke 18, 38. The son of David. Christ's kingdom is a real, and palpable, and yes, it is a physical kingdom. It's not just out here somewhere. So therefore, it cannot be realized without a real physical incarnation. Remember last week, I, I spoke of those who, who would teach that his incarnation only appeared to be real. See, like so many today, they were presupposing the, the philosophical categories of their day. Well, like he couldn't have possibly been a real man. It just looked like one for our benefit. The docetists. No. No. He, he had his, remember when he was resurrected, one of my favorite funny passages where all the disciples are losing their minds. They're, they're very confused. And Jesus says, do you have anything to eat? Well, I, 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 that did, we'll get to there. It's in John. <clears throat> Such a kingdom men have been trying to establish for centuries, but it seems to us now that the nations of the earth are farther away from this kind of a kingdom than ever before. A perfect kingdom demands a perfect king. His kingdom of glory, his throne in the midst, was God's first promise through the angel Gabriel, Gabriel to Mary. It links together the incarnation with the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign in the, over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Now, if we were really, really going to boil it all down, we would say that the incarnation's primary purpose, the primary reason that the eternal son came into the world was to glorify his father. In his great intercessory prayer, we just walked through this in our sermon series, Jesus said, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. God had been glorified in creation, in the remarkable deliverance, deliverances of the people of Israel, and in the exercise of his power over his enemies. But at no time was God as glorified like this when Jesus came. God would never have been glorified in the Son if the Son had failed in his earthly mission either, to the smallest degree. But Jesus can say, I finished the work you gave me to do. Nothing was left undone. And to everything that Jesus did, his Father's glory was in view. We, we've talked about that much. His earthly mission is complete. So, quick review. Jesus came to reveal God to man. He came to reveal man to man. He came to redeem to restore and to reign as king. Therefore, I have set my king on Zion's holy hill. Let me close with this line from, from uh, Benjamin Warfield. I quoted him earlier. And he says this, and this is what we all have to ask ourselves. This, this can all be some kind of you know, analytical study or whatever, but it's not intended to be. Since these things are true, then we, ask to, we have to answer the question that Francis Schaeffer asked, how shall we then live? 
What must our response be to the Lord Jesus in his kingly glory as prophet, priest, and potentate? Listen to this. The real thing for you to settle in your minds, therefore, is whether Christ is truly a redeemer to you and whether you find an actual redemption in him. Or are you ready to deny the master that bought you and count his blood as an unholy thing? Do you realize that Christ is your redeemer and has actually shed his blood for you as your ransom? Do you realize that your salvation has been bought bought at a tremendous price, at the price of nothing less precious than blood, and that the blood of Christ, the Holy One of God? Or, go a step further, do you realize that this Christ, who has thus shed his blood for you, is himself your God? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your Son, and we thank you that at this time this season of giving and giving gifts that we can reflect upon the ultimate gift of your son lord help us give us strength to stand firm to stand for truth that we would recognize in our own hearts our our propensity to wickedness and that only by your grace And by the precious incarnation, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, do we have any hope of escaping the mastery of sin? I'll give you all the glory for this. We would glorify your name in all things. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.